Thank you for joining us tonight. So for those of you that uh, regular at Central Park Library, you might recognize me. My name is Min Pasaki. So I'm one of the master gardener and I'm the one that uh, organized uh, and coordinating the program at Central Park Library. So today we sort of, you know, come virtual for the first time uh, for gardening class. And um, we uh, thank you everyone for joining us. So I will post uh, a link to the handout for this talk that will be helpful for you. And I'm happy to introduce uh, Janice Carey, so one of our master gardener that will uh, share with us the topic tonight, get to know your good bugs and use IPM to outwit the bad ones. Thank you, Janice, for uh, being our speaker tonight. Thanks for having me. This is a wonderful time. Um, this is a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, when I actually experienced um, at 18, I had, um, some aphids on my first vegetable garden and I grabbed my pesticide and I sprayed them and realized I wiped out a whole bunch of baby ladybugs. And ever since then, um, in the seventies, I became a, what's out in California, a certified nursery professional, which is nurseryman to a lot of people. And then in 1998, I became a master gardener with the express purpose of doing the hotline to see if I could help people not used as many pesticides and come up with ways to um, to be able to do their gardening. So um, I'm here now hoping that I can help you come up with ways that you can make your gardening um, more pleasurable because you don't have to fight the bugs, let bugs fight bugs. So if you're out on the West Coast in California, we do have a program where we have a helpline and you can call it or you can go down to our website and do an email and we're able to diagnose your bug problems, your pest problems your, for your house, say, or your disease problems um, that were available from for phone calls from 9.30 to 12.30, I believe. And um, we also, you can go to that website and sign up for our monthly garden tips. Um, it's quite um, nice because for our areas, it gives you the information of things that are going on, when to prune, things that you need to know. We also have eight demonstration gardens for our area, Cupertino, Gilroy, Palo Alto, and Sunnyvale, um, four more in San Jose. So um, if that interests you, you can type in your Google search for Santa Clara County Master Gardeners uh, Demonstration Garden and the, and the page will come up. We also do um, events, and if you type in Santa Clara County Master Gardener events, you'll get the page that'll give you classes like this. They're going on all over the valley and you can get more information on other topics. Finally, like what you have here is a class and if people need talks for their um, groups, we do a speakers bureau. And finally, I am, it's for the school garden advisory. So if you have a school garden that is having trouble with, we all are having trouble with schools right now getting up with this COVID. So um, do think of us, we try, you can go to our website, look for school garden requests and put in your request for help. We don't put in the gardens, but we hold your hand and get the gardens up or we restore gardens that are in trouble and we help you get your gardens growing. So. That said, that's what we do for the community, and I'm glad to be here to talk to you today. Um, so my goals for this is to help you to find out those good bugs. And for you in Wisconsin or Florida, it may not be bugs, but most of these are around the full country. And then hopefully by the time you leave, you can create your own pest management plan. And we have a University of California IPM database and that has um, using IPM, the, the principles, to solve the problem. So you don't have to say, well, I don't know about the pest. I don't know what to do. My, my request for you is I'm going to cover a lot of information. Just sit back, relax. You have a handout that has all the information of the, the uh, bugs. You can go back to our university site and look up information. You don't need to memorize this. I do give you little hooks about, well, it looks like a fairy. That might be something you want to remember. But everything else, you've already got to have it by the time it's over and you can come back and look at it. So 
don't worry, I'll get you through it. So my first IPM class as a master gardener in Santa Cruz um, was he pulled up and said, observe, observe, observe. If I teach you anything in this class, observe. So this, he quoted the science teacher, high school science teacher at Santa Cruz, but this was from the HERP advisor for Santa Cruz. And after we had this talk, we looked at the whole world in a different way. And if I can give that to you today, I've done something. So remember, if you come out with anything from this class, just observe and learn, look and learn where the bugs are and see them so that you don't have to go and use chemical means. And of course, I'm wondering if all of you might recognize this. This saved our citrus industry from the mealybugs that were um, destroying it and cutting the crop down to 1 16th of the norm in the 1900s. And it came from Australia. She's a, she's a visitor. And 99% of you know, this is a ladybug. Really that easy. It's learning to see the shape and figuring out what it is and then using that to protect it and use it as your predator. So we're gonna dive in. Um, if you have your handout available, um, I'm gonna be covering page two of the bugs on that page. If you don't, you can just write down page two and go back to it. It's really useful. So we're gonna start um, that there are, um, many of you had second grade that insects and they talked about the three body parts and they talked about um, what an insect was. And, and there are many, and it's an order in the classification, but there are butterflies in that insect population, there are flies, and this is Hemptera is a, as a group with 50,000 to 80,000 bugs. And what you need to know, there are only five bugs in the whole of the family. Rest of them eat plants. So that makes it really easy. If, you, if I teach you these five bugs, you can pretty much say there's an X on the back and it's not one of the five, you eat, so you're gone. So we're gonna cover in the left corner, there's a mute, minute pirate beetle. And if you look at the top where the black is, so you can see easy, you see a V, that's the top of the X. And then it comes down at the light part and it comes in to those black tail, almost like a waistcoat. That's the end of the X. It's seen very much easier in the white square where we have the, the, the assassin bug. Yes, an assassin and it has the X on its back. Um, it's not so clear in the black one. I'll show you more when we get closer. And, um, and it's, it's not as clear, but there are X's on the back. If you see it, one with an X, it's a plant eater. This is in the family of true bugs and um, things like cicadia, um, the leaf hoppers, the bed bugs, and the shield bugs, all those bugs are in the family. If some of them have excess, some don't, but the ones except for these five are all plant eaters. So if you see an X and it's not one of them, well, too bad for you, um, you're gone. So the minute pirate beetle is fun. I always think of a pirate in black and white, like um, the pirate films we've been seeing and um, put a patch on this one and you've got, but remember it's only a 16th of an inch. So what you're seeing is, eggs of an insect and it's actually sticks its beak in and sucks it out and so he, you can see the ones that are full and plump that it's he's going to and he's eaten that way one two three four five so you can see he's eaten some of them they are um the smallest of these bugs um and usually the first predator in spring to get out there um they, they're active their whole life some of these are that i'm going to show you are only active their larva or young or another stage. And um, this one is around through its whole period from its starting to end. And, it, and this bug will eat like 20 spider mites in a day. So it's a great bug to have around. Again, I'm talking 1 16th of an inch. We're talking closer to the uh, lead on a pencil. Okay. So, so that's number one of the five. Next one is the big eye bug. Now you can see the X better here. You can see almost like there's a V 
and then it comes down where the the wings come over the back and you can see the bottom of it. Um, again, this is a one eighth inch bug. Um, again, these are bugs that are great because they'll eat your aphids and your um, caterpillars and, um, and um, mites. So um, another great bug and this, this is number two of the five. Notice the eyes. So we've had a pirate, we've had the eyes and now the predatory uh, which the only one is a spiny stink bug. And um, there is an A, think of a linebacker, think of a samurai. This bug on the left of the square on the top here is has pointed shoulders. Note, there is a definite point. When you look at the bug on the right, which is almost a lookalike in some ways, is that's um, the brown marmorated stink bug and it came from Asia in the 1990s. It's not a good bug, it's a pest. It does have the X in the back. Some of the X's are a little bit long, you can see the V, but um, but you can see this one has a rounded shoulder. It's like a bump, like a shoulder bump. It doesn't have the point. So think linebacker, that spiny spine, a spine on the shoulder. Find a way to put a hook on this bug that you can remember. Notice. This maps the nose on the good bug, the spiny, uh, spined um, so stink bug has a short snout. And if it did any doubt, the brown marmorated stink bug um, has a larger snout. And notice that the um, antenna have white dots on them. So um, they're a little bit different, but save the one that's good and get rid of the one that isn't. So that's number three. And then we have our assassin bug. Um, it's like 1.6 inches. I did have one that was a bit longer that came off one of my organic produce. And again, you've got um, the um, aphids and caterpillars and spider mites and scale. Scale, if you ever, if you ever see a bump on your plant and you smash it and you get blood, that's a scale and it's sucking your plant. So um, they'll actually eat those too. So this is a good bug. Um, it has a nasty, ferocious bite. If it bites you, it hurts. So don't, if you see your children playing with them, tell them don't mess with it. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful bug. And then here's another picture. And I have this one because on the right, you can see that X on the back. Is it's kind of a circle on the bottom, but it's a definite X. So again, look for those X's. And then the very um, last one, kind of as quickly, was called the damsel bug. It looks very much like the assassin. Um, it again, the, the a lot of the uh, grass uh, bugs that are attacking look kind of greyhoundish like. If you can sort of see the head on this, looks like a greyhound. Um, and um, you'd say, well, I can't tell the difference between an assassin and a damsel. Well, well, a damsel always goes around with his hoop skirt and has ruffles on the bottom. So if you'll notice the end of the wings on the top photo has, has what would look like ruffles or veins of the bug. And the assassin has few or no veins, it just looks solid. And so that's the only way you can tell the difference, really a major difference is the wing edge. So we've just quickly covered, and and very quickly, hem, hem, hemi, sorry, hempatera, um, and the five good ones, and that's it. Everybody else is going to eat your plants. So I'll just stop right now. Um, Mint, do we have any questions about this group? Uh, are you going to cover spider mite later? There is a question um, about uh, how to identify and manage spider mite. Good question. Spider mites, um, we, we, you will be able to find in the, the IPM website, but just so someone knows that if you start looking at your plant and there's tiny white dots in the leaf. So you look at the leaf and you look down at it and you say, oh my goodness, there's white little dots. And what the spider mites do is they suck the green out of it. So it looks what the word is stippled. It's not a big white spot. They're a little tiny. If you took a pin and shoved it on the leaf and went like this, it would make stipple marks. 
And then when you flip the leaf that, and so you're, you're looking at a plant going, hmm, I see a stipple mark too. So you flip the leaf over and you say, oh, look inside. Where the veins are, you'll see dusty webbings. And if you really want to know, you can put a white piece of paper and go like that, tap it, and on the paper, you'll see a little red dot in it. And I'm talking like you should have a hands lens on this page too. You're going to be down looking and saying, I see what looks like a tiny red dot. And it's sort of like, it's even like if I put a little dot on a paper, but it's moving, that's a spider mite. So that's how you would know it's a spider mite. Good yeah, question. And, and I, I just post the link to you see IPM spider mite on the Good. chat box. So okay. you can be able to read more about spider mite. And, and we will be going there at that site. So we're going to go on. Okay. okay. So then, and so if you go on to page um, three, I'm going to cover the insects on that one. So everyone knows the ladybug, also formerly called lady beetle. But what is this? And and actually, this scaly alligator, orange and black alligator, is actually the ladybug larva. And that's what fooled me as a child at 18, or teenager, that we had ladybug larva eating it. And I said, eh, bugs. Oh my goodness, get the raid, kill it. So yeah, no. These are actually, the ladybug larva um, is amazing because um, it actually, not only does it eat the aphids and white flies and mealybugs and scale, the larva eats more than the mature adult ladybugs. So they're wonderful for um, pest control. So everybody loves ladybugs and for good reason. So then, because they come in a lot of different characteristics, you know, you don't necessarily say, oh, that gold one, does that a ladybug? I don't know what everybody has in their country or their country, but we only, we usually see the black, the, the the blacks and the reds. We don't have any of the gold ones out here, but all these are ladybugs. Um, and, but I was so excited when I had green ladybugs at my beans and um, did not know that the spotted cucumber beetle on my cucumbers or all these Mexican bean beetles were not ladybugs. I thought, oh, look at all the ladybugs when I was a beginning gardener. No, they do not come in green. So do not, they look alike, but they're really not ladybugs. So just be aware, green ladybugs are not ladybugs. Um, and if we have some time, I'll talk about a few others. So, um, and so um, I'm gonna go on. And um, these are quite elegant. Their backs really are looking glistening and their heads are orange. They look almost outer space-like. Definitely an orange head. I like to call them leather wing beetles but other people call them soldier beetles. Um, and um, I put, I moved into my first house and had a rose garden. And the first year the ladybugs came and took out my aphids. And the second year I had these orange headed strange things. And instead of grabbing my spray, I grabbed um, the internet and I said, oh, this is a soldier beetle, it's a ladybug. And sure enough, in a week, all my aphids were gone. So they're wonderful for um, aphids and small stucking insects. And if you get them, just consider them beautiful because the orange is very startling. It's a really gorgeous bug. And then, but speaking of gorgeous and getting more gorgeous is the fairy-like lacewing. Um, they do come in brown and they do come in green. And their wings really are as crystal clear as you see on the screen. And when they fly, they do look extremely like fairies. They are just absolutely gorgeous. And if you have a bug zapper, if you don't know what they are, you probably can look in the bottom of your bug zapper and you'll find a lot of dead ones because they're really attracted to light. Um, it's really sad, but you can lose them that way. So let me go to the next one. And unfortunately, its offspring doesn't look as pretty. Um, this is a, um, a lacewing larva, and it grabs its prey, which it has, with these hollow jaws of these, and it inserts poison, which paralyzes the bug, and then it sucks the juices out. 
And um, this particular larva can devour 200 or more pests or eggs per week in the, during their two to three week development period. So um, it's a really nice to have. I had one land on me um, and they can come in different colors. They can be greenish or brown, but what you need to look at is those jaws. And if you see kind of what looks like a um, job of the hut with jaws, it's a lacewing larva. And, and these are quite an amazing bug. Um, the adults looking fairy-like, but I think someone probably writing like Hans Christian Andersen or someone must have been looking at nature and said, Oh, fairies, they have their ba baby's basket on a thread. And sure enough, here's lacewing larva, um, excuse me, lacing egg in the right top corner where you see it on a filament, a hair. And then there's the egg up in the air that keeps it away from predators. And um, someone came running up to me. I teach gardening for Santa Clara Unified School District too. And um, they brought me a leaf with this on and said, this is, this is a bug, we should kill it, right? And I'm like, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is the first time ever in my life that I've actually seen a lacewing egg and I just, I'm marveling. Um, when you, you can actually buy these for, um, if you have a bug problem. Um, and what they do is they, they have an insectary where they grow them and then they take their scissors and cut off and they cut the filament and they put them in a box and then they can send them to you. So um, the egg turns into the larva, and then you can see the furry little pupa, which is the form it comes before it breaks out into the adult. The only time this harvests or eats is when it's in the larva form. The adults eat um, pollen, so just so you know. Um, so they're an interesting and good bug to have in your beneficial bug. And always when you see them at night now, maybe the light will be dry and you'll say, oh my goodness, that's the fairy-like lacewing. So, um, so now I'm going on to page um, four. And the reason I'm going through this is because then you have, we had the professor give a talk and he gave us this and now I have it for you. So the surfed fly, is a really out here is an amazingly um, beautiful fly. It acts, we used to, as children call it helicopter flies because it, it can actually move sideways and up and down and, and zoom off. Um, but the larva looks more like a dagger. Um, think of a spear point. Um, and it um, is usually, I don't know what it is about biologists, but they love catching these things when they're eating things. So that black that's hanging off is actually an aphid. Um, if you need to know the difference between this larva and a caterpillar that's eating, the head on a caterpillar is rounded. Notice that this particular thing has a point. Um, so this is actually a predatory. When you have them eating your plants, you'll see that it's rounded and it's eating like my hand. So you'll need to, it's rounded and the head is rounded and it has mandibles, teeth, I mean, not teeth, but the mouth parts, and it will be eating at the plant. Whereas this you can see is meant as an arrow to stab and to take out the aphid. So that will help you know. So we are gonna get to look at, oh shoot. <laughs> Let me, oh no, don't do that, oh well. We're gonna look at this, the hoverfly flying and then we're gonna get out of this hopefully. Okay, it, it's actually quite beautiful and quite interesting. Um, and double click again. Yeah, I am. Let me go uh, escape. Let's see if I can back. Okay, I'm gonna stop it. And now we're going to escape, hopefully. Oh, well, hold on a moment. I'll take care of this. Um, Hold on, I'm going to go back in. Sorry about that. Let's take, take questions for a moment. Um, and oh, here we go. Do you have any questions, Mitt? Um, here we go. 
No, there's one that I, I would rather discuss at the end. About okay. The Don't worry, we'll get back to it. Yeah. It just periodically, I'm, I'm, there we go. And current side, there we are. Okay, and um, here we are. So we're looking again at the hoverfly larva. Um, and you can see that um, it does have the feet like a caterpillar, but always look at the, the nose. And then you will leave it alone and let it take out your insects. And then, oops, oops, oops. then we do have what is known as a predatory wasp. Now we are going to um, get into what is often used in science fiction. Um, when Richard Merrill shared this information with us, he said he was, it was about the time the movie Predator came out. And there was this one scene where um, a gentleman was at Thanksgiving dinner, speaking of Thanksgiving, and he had been parasitized by the alien and came out. And one of the theater goers ran from the theater in panic because of it. And this professor's running after and he gets a lobby. He says, don't worry, don't worry. It's just part of nature. It's all natural. I don't think that really made her feel secure in anything. But in, it doesn't happen at our level, but at an insect level, there are um, insects that lay their eggs in other insects. And the predatory wasp is very tiny. It's non-stinging. It's, it's, you can see here in this picture, it's the size of the aphid. It takes its ovipositor, the pointed end, stabs it in an aphid, and lays the, his egg in. And you can purchase these wasps to be able to um, have them in your garden if you need them for aphids. Um, the nice thing about them is you don't need to see them. You just look for what they do. So now a normal aphid is, is more like the dark one, actually that's even done, is a normal aphid. But when you look at these, they look like they're balloons. They, they look, and they look a different color and they're blown up. Well, each one of these blown up aphids have an egg inside and you can even see the circle where the fly ate off out of the aphids. So you'll look at your um, aphids and you'll stop and you'll stare at them and you'll say, oh, some of these are really weird colors. Some of them are bloated and some of them have holes. You don't need to do a thing. The, these are breeding on your aphids and in a week or two, maybe two weeks, your aphids will be gone. So it's wonderful that nature provides for us to get rid of things because, um, because what happens is that um, in general, you'll see this is actually a, a predator prey cycle that you might get in a zoology class. This is actually for rabbits and wolves, but it fits for anything that's predator and prey. The blue part would be a prey, the prey, and the red part is the predator. And what happens is the numbers of prey grow. So your aphids will be growing in number, and, and there aren't any enough, say, ladybugs to come and deal with them. And all of a sudden, the ladybugs will find your aphids and the population will begin to grow until the point where, at that point where the red line meets the blue line, then there are enough ladybugs that the population of the aphid crashes. And then it comes back up and the ladybug cycle comes back up. So what most of you will experience is that you will have aphids or some other problem and there won't be any answer you won't see anything and then a, maybe a week if you've been spraying it'll be a while it'll be a month so here's the deal you grab your chemical spray and you spray your prey and you kill the predators you kill whatever was eating them it for aphids they are born pregnant and inside that pregnant aphid is another aphid so every seven and they are born live. So every seven to eight days in the warm season, you can have another batch of aphids. Now you decided to spray chemicals. You killed all your, your ladybugs. It'll take a month or more for them to come back, which means you are going to be spraying 
to your plants again and again and again to stop the aphids because they're going to keep coming from other areas every seven to eight days. In fact, the reality is that um, they, they can actually get up to quite a large number in a month that if you didn't have them, they, they're necessary for the prey to live on. So it becomes an issue that how much spraying do you want to do? How much work do you want to do? You really want to be spraying off both of them. So the answer becomes this article that I gave you. It tells you the beneficial flowers to put in your garden so that these bugs, the good bugs, the beneficial, the natural enemies to all your pests are going to stay there eating the pollen and the food and there they will be waiting. And then as soon as you get it, immediately you start seeing that you're not having bug problems. And that's exactly what happened to me. I planted these plants in my own garden and discovered that um, I don't see that crash and burn cycle. I don't see the prey and predator cycle. I have them eating in the garden and when the problem comes, then you don't have the problem. So we just created food for your good bugs and you're farming your land for the good bugs and creating predators for the bad and you're bringing your whole garden into balance. Think about it. Now you have no work. Good thing to do. Here we go. So, but what does that mean? So this is what we use to plan for integrated pest management. It's a part of it. So now I'm gonna take you into integrated pest management so you can use the whole cycle and create your plan. So what is it? Well, first of all, the bottom one, you can use it anywhere. In our California, we're the breadbasket often of the world, of our United States. And in our agricultural areas, some of you may have driven by and seen now flower borders around the agriculture areas. They are using IPM to have the beneficial bugs there waiting and dealing with their pest problems. It's just becoming normal. We also, in our wildland and natural areas, you can count on it that they're gonna use IPM to come up with a plan to deal with the problem. Say it's a non-native bug that comes in. They're going to work out an integrated pest management on how to solve that problem. And finally, in our urban areas, it's becoming more and more popular, just what I'm describing to you, to be able to use it in your garden. So uh, integrated pest manager top box is just coming up a way to solve your pest problems or your disease problems, but you're going to minimize the risk to your people and environment. So you're going to come up with a plan that's the best way to do it. So this triangle I'm going to cover again. I'm just going to briefly touch on it right now. This, this is, as you can see, the biological is up near the top. That was where we've used bugs and diseases to defeat our problems. Down at the bottom, though, of the triangle, notice the prevention. Prevention is your main thing. If you don't have it in your garden, you don't need to deal with it. So prevention's great. Then the next step up would be cultural and sanitation. A step after that would be physical and mechanical. Then our biological. And notice at the top, the last is chemical. It's going to require the most work from you. The prevention means it won't even be there. So IPM is approach for greater effectiveness in control in your garden. IPM is rather than eliminating the pests, you're going to look at the five areas of this and you will see that, um, that you're going to find factors that are going to affect those pests or whatever allows them to thrive and you're going to stop that. So the prevention means that you're going to have healthy crops and disease resistant plants. So you're gonna set that as your norm and anything coming into it is the opposite of that. And so you're going to actually create a system where it's actually preventing them. In other words, for example, ants, you know, they come in through cracks. If you caulk the cracks, the ants can't get in. They may find another way, but you've stopped the problem. So we're gonna continue. So, how do we do this? 
So the first thing is you've got to know what it is. Is it is it a ladybug? Is it a pest? You've got to know what this is. Is it a pest and identify it? And then you need to watch it. You need to know if you need to do something. So monitoring means that you're going to ID it. You need to say, hmm, got a lot of them here. Hmm. And look, the leaves are twisting. It's causing damage. You're going to assess the situation because you're going to make a plan. So you, you have to know the, the pest and you have to realize that you have to pick the best management strategy. strategy. And at this point, I wanna say that um, you don't need to look at this and go, oh my goodness, I don't know anything. Well, the University of California set up a situation so you have all the, the information at your fingertips. So you don't need to know it. Just know that IPM will solve this problem. So we're gonna go back to the, the, the main thing is prevention. And then cultural is how you grow things and sanitation is cleanup. So for instance, culturally, you decide, hey, I'm gonna use a high nitrate um, chemical fertilizer and I'm gonna get a ton of lush growth, but then the aphids absolutely love that lush growth and I now have to deal with the aphids. Far better if I had roses and I used a couple cups of alfalfa meal and it grew slower and culturally, they'd be less likely to have aphids. So not only have I um, dealt with that, I'm now dealing with that problem. But with sanitation, you're actually reducing, that also reduces the pest getting in because it won't be in the leaves from last year. It, sl it also slows the reproduction. And if they get growing enough, like an aphid, it'll fly away, it'll disperse, and you can affect their survival because you're making it less likely for them to thrive. So also then we're gonna go up a little higher, the mechanical and physical ways. When you mechanically, well, you can kill it directly, you can block things out, or you can make it unsuitable. So when I put out traps for rodents, it's a mechanical control. When I'm mulching, rather than having to pull a weed, see, this is less work. Instead of having to pull the weeds, I put a mulch down of bark or something else, and there's no light so that the weeds don't come up. So I am blocking the light, but I made it unsuitable. And finally, often you can, if you're growing vegetables, you could put a row cover, which is a white cloth that lets the light and the rain through, but it doesn't let the bugs in. Or you can, if you've got bird problems, you can put screens and there's a physical control and you're using mechanical or physical controls as examples of how to do this. So now we go to the next one. And we have had a whole section on the biological control of natural enemies. You've now know some predators and you know how they can be parasites on other bugs, but there are pathogens now. There are now things where they've said, hey, this bug is dying. What if we mashed them all up and figured out what the virus was or the bacterial that is killing them? So you can now buy, say, for example, Bacillus thuringus, which they call BT, or on your shelf in your stores, it might say caterpillar killer, but it actually gives disease to caterpillars. It won't affect your honeybees, it won't affect the spiders, it won't affect any other bugs except for your caterpillars. And, um, and, and with that, I'd like to just do a side where this one lady planted a butterfly garden and she said, oh, I'm gonna have butterflies, she was so excited. And she went back to the nursery since I work in nurseries and she said, I'm not getting any butterflies. I don't like this. And she got and asking, did you have any caterpillars? And she said, oh yes. And I sprayed them and I killed them. And I said, and then I said, well, there went your butterflies. <laughs> so, you know, this isn't something you use on everything, but it is for things like cabbage, um, the white cabbage moth that we have that came across our country now lays the little cabbage, um, oh good grief, where's the, um, worms on our cabbages and our calciferous vegetables and our lettuces. Um, that is a nice one to use the BT for. 
and it and it gets rid of it and but you always if you start seeing holes and things you go mm, i can't and then you start looking and you can't find it but if you get them small it's easy you don't want them to live if they get sprayed some of them get sick and like many things they can survive it if it is that makes the only the resistant ones the ones that can live in spite of being sprayed with it and then the next one's breeding won't die from it so you always look to do them when they're small um, and you can look and look and look and um, we had um, in California we can grow cool season over the winter so we were um, having our cabbages out and I noticed the holes and I'm looking and I never found them and I'm talking to my students and I'm lifting leaves and all of a sudden I go ha huh, the inchworm the green worm. I said here this is what's eating our cabbages and so and then you get your remove it and dispose of it and um and the reality is then you um it's gone and either you can use mechanical or you can use biological the other thing about this is that um, you can use a neonicotide and kill your lawn critters that are eating your lawn under your lawn, but now, and that only lasts four months. Um, but if you use a nematode properly, it can last over a year, year and a half to two years. So you can water that into your lawn. It will eat the um, bugs that, that are eating your lawn. And so it again saves money saves time and preserves your lawn. So using biological control can um, help you in your quest to get an IPM pest management program going. Uh, uh, Jan, uh, yes. There is a question on the chat box that does the BT get into the soil and can affect good bacteria or good soil microbes? Well, the one thing is it only affects caterpillars, period. It's like it's a bacteria that won't affect anything else. Plus, it's really sensitive to light. It's one of those things you apply. It's or, it's used in organic um, farming. It's you apply, and then within the sun hitting it, it it's gone. So it's really sensitive to destruction. So it's not the only. If you want to know the danger, and I meant to talk about this, the danger of BT is if you're immune compromised. And um, you spray, when you spray, you wear goggles um, and you always put kind of, you can moisten your fingers and put up the air and you can find the winds blowing. So if you're going to spray in front of you, it's going to blow back in your face. So you always put your back to the wind blowing so the sprays go away from you. Whatever you spray, even if it's neem organic, it can affect you. I'm very chemically sensitive and I use neem once thinking organic is probably safe. And I got it all over me and I was not feeling well for a couple of days. No, it didn't kill me, but you don't want to get things on you. And the only example I've had of BT getting, so I got in someone's eye and grew and they got rid of it. Again, it's, it's, not a, it's not a resistant thing. They can get rid of it, but use, again, as you go up the triangle, it gets more. Um, so when I have used BT, I have the wind blowing, I wear goggles and I ha don't have it going on. I don't have it. So there is a windy day. And if it is, it's mildly in California, we have winds in the afternoon. Um, you would spray before it gets windy and you would also know that it would not, um, and you get it only on the plant. And um, supposedly if you're not immune compromised, you could eat it the same day. Personally, I just wait a couple of days knowing that it's, it's, degraded and it's not there anymore so um it's it's not something that if it got in the soil it wouldn't affect anything but a caterpillar so but i've never i always spray them on the plants and um it doesn't proliferate like um like you would put it in and suddenly it start growing like a bad pest so it's not it's not it's it's used in organic because it's it minimizes on the environment I mean, you can have honeybees land on it. It's not going to hurt them. And it also um, doesn't last long. So that's why people like it. So yeah, thanks for asking. But the oh, chemical, uh, could, yeah, does that help? Uh, just one more question. So then will the BTQ burst that eat the dying caterpillar? Nope, it's, it's only, it only um, affects caterpillars. It's very selective. It's one of the few. There's also some new stuff out where there's apples are spraying for codling moth. It only affects 
the codling moth. It would not affect a bird landing on it, would affect us. These are really selective um, chemical. They're not chemical, they are bacteria. So, um, and they only, it's, there are, I guess the word is zoonotic, but basically there are things that you can get from other animals. Like you might go and um, expose yourself through touching an animal and it would have the disease and you would get it. There are things that are species specific and this is particularly species specific where it doesn't go into any species so far to my knowledge and all testing that it only affects caterpillars. And so it would never affect anything but that caterpillar, which is why we could eat it right away after it. Um, and it has no waiting time on the labels. So, um, but, but I'm always so waiting to see what happens in the shoe fall on the other foot. So I wait a couple of days just because I don't, there's science moves forward and you never know. So I always just play it safe, but, um, but no, it's, it's a wonderful um, thing to use bacteria now because then I don't have to worry. You, many of you have heard of honeybees being um, of the colony collapse disorder of honeybees and we're losing our pollinators and um, I'll, right here's a great place to talk about it. A lot of people will use rose food that's two in one or it has systemic. That systemic that they're talking about is a neonicotide. It actually gets into the plant and makes it poisonous. So when your rose, when a honeybee lands on it, it um, does affect its immune system, but it really affects our bumblebees. We don't see as many bumblebees now. It's two to three times as toxic to bumblebees as it is to honeybees. Um, and so it is causing damage to our bumblebee population. So here you give the rose the food and then the whole pose becomes poisonous. So yes, nothing will eat it, but then the pollinators do get, we have, um, Cornell did a study and has a great paper. Um, I don't know if I have it, but yeah. It's Cornell's um, pollinator network at Cornell and it's the neonicotides and they've done some scientific studies and they have lab studies and um, showing the outcomes of increased mortality by three studies, impaired feedings for hunting bees in two studies, impaired locomotions in four for hunting bees in four studies and so on. And then on the bumblebee um, colonies, they can't create their nests. Um, brood productions problems, colony growth, mortality. So yeah, it's it's a big problem. So chem, the IPM says no, we need to do it that minimizes the damage to the environment, the damage to the people. And so, um, so the chemicals we pick have to be used in conjunction with the other approaches for long-term control. If you're, if you're, again, it's on the top, it's not necessary to use it. You might use what would be soap. In fact, people, their gra your grandmother often took their dish soap out and threw it on the aphids because soap smothers the aphid. They can't breathe through their body. The holes in their body is where their lungs are. And if soap goes in and they can't, it's the oil and the soap smothers them. So that would be a chemical control. Now we have um, horticultural oils which you don't use on hot days or you'll burn up your plants. Well, no, like 90 and over your plants will turn crispy. Um, and we have soap, which works really great on aphids. So, um, so we now, and the chemicals I used to deal with like neonicotine, I'm sorry, nicotine, which used to have a skull and crossbows if you got on it could kill you are no longer on the market. And things that used to last for months like diazinon are no longer on the market, at least in California. Um, so the really bad pesticides have been pulled and there's still some out there, but, but when we use chemical controls, we're not using it to damage the environment. So I'm going to move on here. Um, so this is going to be in my informational area where I can show you where it is. So don't worry about having to memorize this. So this is what I do when I'm faced with a pest. You say, I know what it is. I identify it. You, as we've said, you observe and you assess the numbers and the damage. Then we say, do I need to take action? 
do I need to act? I mean, is it a pest that just comes and goes like a chafer? It's a little brown thing that comes out of your lawn, doesn't do any damage. You might want to just, it winds up at the light sometimes. It, it, you don't need to do anything about chafers, chafer beetles. So, you know, so you, sometimes you don't need to act. It eats some lawn, but it won't hurt your lawns, it won't cause damage. Um, but then the big question, can I prevent it? Can I eliminate it so it won't even happen? And then using the rest of the triangle, the cultural, the sanitation, the physical, mechanical, the biological, and the chemical, I'm gonna create a plan. And then I'm gonna take action. And I'm gonna assess if it worked, okay? So I'm gonna take you in, but how do I know to? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't have your knowledge, Master Gardener, but basically the UC went from chemical to creating IPM when I started and now all the information on the site I'm about to go to covers IPM. So you, and as a master gardener, when you call our hotline, we're using that site to give you information. So I'm actually giving you the case of the kingdom. I'm giving you what we would use to find answers. So you will know how to do it. So I'm going to the IPM, ucanr.edu. Now, IPM means Integrated Pest Management, period. And then the UC is the University of California and it's Agriculture and Natural Resources. So when I have to find this, when I'm showing somebody when I was in a nursery, I'd go to the computer to look up information and show them things. I'd go to IPM and then I go University of California, Agriculture and Natural Resources, and then I'd read you. So just so, but, but, but you'll be getting this in the video. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm just going to go to, um, and I'm going to go. Oh dear. Oh, this is being an interesting day today. Um, I'm just going to go. Oh dear. Okay. Well, here, I'm going to go. See if the, there we go. I'm gonna go there. Thank you. I'd gone to there. It took me away. Sorry about the wait. Here we go. This is um, the IPM site. It's wonderful because um, what we have up here in the top right is a search. So if you wanted to look for aphids alone, you could type in aphids and push search. And um, this will give you. And I'm not gonna go there because you, it's gonna give me too much information. This will give you every research paper that was ever written um, on aphids. And um, it's wonderful if you wanna do a scientific study, but oh my goodness. So you go to, you look for the one that ends in pest notes and it is the one written for the public. So if you say, I don't wanna go to this lady walking with a pink thing, I wanna just look it up, go to pest notes and I'll give it to you. Um, so. Our public site is the this woman under a pink tree. The agricultural pest is a lot more for farming. The natural environment is for the latest, um, for the ones that are giving us pest problems and the exotics are the bottom right box. So I'm going to click on the home garden turf and landscape pest. This is the one that those master gardeners go to. So now if you didn't know, the IPM, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm over here. Oops, I'll go right back. Right here on this site is a panel. It says home. It's a white area that's on the left. And the second one down says, what is IPM? I'll just go right there. And you'll see where the hands lens and it gives you definitions. And I'm gonna go a little down. There we go. See, it has the biological, all those things that we needed, the cultural and then it tells you exactly the list that I went down, the identification, monitoring, guidelines, I spelled it out, preventing and the combination and the action. So if you don't have this, it's here in this site. Now, I say, okay, that's fine, but look at how do I find what I'm dealing with? So the first area is pests of homes, structures, people, and pests. So what if I have fleas? What if I have bed bugs? What if I have something eating my house? What if I have birds or mammals or which is squirrels? Or if I have lizards? All that is in this section. 
Okay. So if say I want to talk, so I'm clicked on that, and here you see ants. So I clicked on ants. It's in there. So if um except I'm gonna go back and you see a QT on this. QTs means like a quick study or something. You can click on that and it gets you to the whole thing you could need to know. So if you want to go fast, you can go to QT. And again, look at what they have for prevention. Caulk the cracks. Isn't there make your house less attractive? That's prevention. But then they invade and they're going to give you the other parts of the triangle and some prevention too. They're going to give you some sanitation. So they already have it here for you. You can go in here and make your plans. Then you can do it. And then you can see if it works. So any questions at this moment about this? I'm going to go to another area. OK. So I'm going to back out and go back to the main page of this. And we're going to go to pests in our garden. So say I have flowers that are getting hurt. And they give you all these flowers. And um, I'm just going to go to impatience. I don't know if you have it. But if you look over here on the so right side, first of all, it's really nice because it gives you insects or invertebrates. So just know that means insects. And then on the next to that says diseases. And so all the diseases that attack your impatients are in there. You can click on them and say, nope, doesn't look like it. Oh, this is it, the virus disease, yes. And, so, and then environmental disorders are, okay, it got hot and something happened, the sun burned it. Let's go down to an environmental disorder like sunburn. So you might think, oh, my plant has a disease. No, it's actually the sun, got, you planted it too much in the sun. It got too much light, too much heat, not enough moisture, and it dies in the between, and it gives you a solution for it. So it might not be a disease. It might not be a um, pest. So this will give you that information, which is wonderful. It also talks about maybe vertebrates or weeds that might cause it problems. So this will give you everything you need for um, dealing with it, for making your IPM. So I'm going to get out of flowers. Now, I often go to vegetables. So say in the spring, you're growing your cabbage. So we're going to start with cabbage. Now, right over on the right side, we have the invertebrates again, and we have the insects, and we have the diseases. So um, let's go to this. Um, this is aphids. This is cabbage aphids. This is the wonderful thing about this right now. It first of all says, how do you know it's an aphid? So it says identification. So it's gonna give you descriptions. It's gonna have a picture. It's gonna talk about its life cycle. Like it, in a mild climate here, they can have 12 aphids a day, which can create enormous amount of aphids. They don't, and they also are um, the sexual forms and produce eggs over the winter. So they're gonna hang on. So you can look through your plants and see what's going on. So, okay, we know it's an aphid. So then we look at the damage and it'll tell you what the damage is. So you start seeing leaves twisting. And sometimes you'll have a, a pest come like an aphid and then your beneficial will come. And I would get calls on the hotline saying, I've got twisted up leaves like a corkscrew. And I say, do you look inside? And they say, nothing's inside. I said, well, you had, a, a sucking insect infestation and something helped you out and got rid of it. So um, it doesn't mean just because you see, um, it doesn't mean that it um, doesn't mean it didn't damage it. So aphids um, suck and then they put mildew out and, and sticky. So if you're walking under a tree that you suddenly find your feet feeling sticky, there's some sort of stuck, sucking insects on that tree. It may not be an aphid. You can think, look up sucking insects and you would find that it would be things like spider mites could even make it, or but you could find things like scale and um, millibug. A lot of things that can make, if they're sucking, can make it sticky. And when it comes out the end, it can make a black mold. So when I see a leaf on like this one, 
is sooty mold. You can see it's got a beautiful green leaf, but then you see this blackness on it. That is actually mold growing on what they would call exudate or maybe this what coming out of the other end of an aphid that this nectar and it creates sooty mildew. So if you start seeing that, you go, oh, let me look around here. What's going on? So um, the only one that, um, and here's an example of leaf curling. So, and the, the woolly app, the only one that you really can't just, and I have to say that there is one that doesn't really, this woolly apple aphid is this fuzzy one right here. This happens to get on apple trees and then in the winter it goes down to the roots. I waited about four years for some creature to come and take it out and their coat being furry doesn't allow that. So, um, so I happen to know that the that um, there was one of our master gardener classes, we had a farmer come that does organic farming. And this is over the fence. This is not UC advice, um, but he would take coffee grounds, put water in them and then sieve out the liquid and spray them on the aphids, the woolly apple aphids. And he said it killed them. So I did it and they died. I just recently had a school. Again, you do not want to use pesticides at a school, told them and they killed theirs. So um, this gentleman is was quite, now went on to do the um, apple site and created the orchards at Apple. Um, I believe Dave Muffley. And at one time he had an actually uh, an eye, um, a, sorry, a um, full food creating farm where he would have packets that you could come pick up. And then he stopped that and then he did oak and then he did this, this um, apple, um, he created the apple campus landscaping. But here you are that now this man gave everyone on this thing a way to get rid of this. So um, it isn't recommended through the UC. So it's just something you can try. And if it doesn't, you can come back and use some chemical means, but I kind of like trying things. Um, so um, you've monitored them. Here's an example of you suddenly saw the aphids being killed by the parasitic wasp. You said, oh, I don't need to do anything. So, um, but um, so you can, they're very responsive to biological controls. If you haven't used pesticides, broad spectrum, they kill the natural enemies then you're gonna find that there are bugs that will take out your aphids. So, um, so many predators, and they have a list right here on the third, under biological control, the third paragraph, you can see the list right here, lady beetle, lacewing, soldier beetles, you've now seen in the surface fly. And I will show you where to find more about them after I finish this. Um, you right here is a link for natural enemies. It's also right here, um, it's on the sidebar. If you look for natural enemies, they actually have a whole book out, do you see now? And if you'd like, there's a whole list of natural enemies here, far more than we covered, but it's available to you. And if you don't, you see something and you say, oh, I'm not quite sure that's a good bug. You can go through this list and you can find them. So the Natural Enemies Gallery and then, uh, yes. Oh, can I just to remind you it's 508. Yes. Are we going to 530 though? Or are we okay? Uh, okay. Well, let me let me cover this. There is a poster here in the Natural Enemies area. And right here, it's, it's um, the poster. Sorry, let me go back here. The poster is the third one down and it will give you the beneficials, pictures. So if you don't have your handout and you go to here and you go to the Natural Enemies Galley, um, which is gonna be on your sidebar, you can find pictures. So um, so I'm gonna go back. So I, I'd like to add one thing, you know, yes. uh, Anne mentioned earlier, 
So at some point, if you think that you cannot figure it out yourself, you know, we're here to help. So yes. I just put the links again that if you take a good picture and email us with question, uh, one of our volunteers will get back to you, you know, with the answer because, you know, um, it can get overwhelmed with all the information. But if you have, a, you know, now with the smartphone and, you know, good camera, uh, take good picture and email us with the question. So we, we are happy to answer the question. And then, yes. um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, there is a one question about uh, rosemary. Yes. So um, there's a question that there is a foaming white, foaming liquid on rosemary. Oh. What is yeah, that's that's a bug that eats that uh, that eats it, it's it's unsightly. I think they call them spittle bugs. Um, what I do is just put on rubber gloves and smash them and get rid of them. Um, or I, if they're really bad on the rosemary, I just cut it out and throw it in. You, you don't want to cut all your plant down to nothing, but if if it's just on one limb, you can cut it off and throw it in a plastic bag, tie a knot, throw it in the garbage, and it's gone. Again, that is again sanitation. You just got rid of it. And if there's no more around, you've just removed it. You've done prevention. So um, yeah, spittle bugs are really big in some places. If you get on it, you can pretty much get rid of it really easy. You just have to go out with your gloves and just smash them. Um, or if, and also I've rinsed them off, but then they just come back. So I find the glove rubber glove works really well. Um, but the one thing, in, and I need to go finish because ants, will actually protect your aphids and and actually fight off your beneficial bugs. And so you will you can read in this later, but if it's a, if your plant is land, landing on a on a fence, the ants can come up there and go out a branch and they will actually carry aphids to your plants. So generally I put out it says here you can use ant stakes in blue down here in the bottom. And you can put ant stakes and get rid of ant. And you can also take um, blue um, masking tape and go backwards with the sticky side out. And then you can buy a tangle foot, which is uh, like a glue-like substance. And you can, please don't get your hands in it. Take a stick and you smear it on the um, band and the ants can't get up across the sticky. Um, and then as the tree grows, you can cut your band and or if your landscaper come, your landscape uh, worker comes and blows and gets mud in it and and makes it non-sticky. You can cut it off. So um, I use that. And then it, here again, it shows cultural control and chemical controls, which would be soaps, are really great. And then I'll show you pictures of every aphid known to man. So this is what you can do to be able to do it. And so if you have a fruit tree, say my fruit tree is having trouble. I'm going to go to my peaches. My peaches in the spring get, you know, the leaves. So, um, so you would go to nectarines and peaches. And here's the nice thing. I wanted to show you this. It's really important. Cultural tips. Here it talks about, and and it is um, California. So there is some of it's different in that. Um, when you would spray might be different for like a dormant oil spray, but everything else would be fine. So it would help you to be able to know what to do for your tree. And again, here you see your insects and your diseases and then and they're all well, California and then environmental disorders. So you can take this and um, use it, you know, to know, I, I, oh, I'm having a great problem. I will go into IPM and I will go and I'll go down to the berries or I can go to lawns or I can go to trees. And down the here is some common pests. So you can click on them, find your weeds. And finally, it has pet alternate to pesticides for use and has more biological control. So this is a really amazing place where you can create plants. Um, it looks intimidating, it isn't. If you know what your plant is, you can go into your um, shrubs. This is down here in pests here, the second group. And it says flowers, fruit trees, lawn, and trees and shrubs. So I go here and here's the names of all these plants. So I'm just gonna grab alder, don't know what I'm gonna find. 
And again, you find all this about what to do. So you can, and it has the pictures of the cones here on the right, bottom right, you know, for that. So it shows it's normal. So you could look up birch. So it gives you everything you need to know on how to deal with your plants. And it will help you through the process, remembering you're trying to find ways to prevent it. And then you rake up your plan and you, that's in there already and do it. So that's about it. I'm gonna open it to questions. I'm also gonna go back, stop the share for a minute while I go um, back. And then I'm gonna to go to, um, excuse me, I'm gonna go here. So there is still a question about like, um, you know, chemical control. So, so if it's, it's used, the question is about like, if it's for organic, you know, even the use of chemical control for the organic option, uh, would that be okay comparing to not using anything at all? So we can oh. have that discussion, but uh, hold on, hold on. I actually do have a list, you know, um, I think the I would let Janice discuss more in detail, but I am posting the link that you know it's not only about how it's impact um, the ecosystem in your ho home only, but you know you have to think about as as a Bay Area. So there is a group of uh, the Bay Area that you know because with the runoff, you know when we have rain, things can collect in the drain and go to the ocean. So there is a list of uh, safer use of some of these chemicals. So I do post it on the chat here if you want to check it out, but I will let Janice discuss about the use of chemical, even though it's for organic production. Yes, um, you know, here's the problem. To be honest with you, they've done studies and people are using more chemicals than the farmers in their homes. Um, outside, the, when you're having a spray service come, there's far more, and actually our cancer, at least for our area, there's more in Santa Cruz than there is here. Again, there's more agriculture, but it's um, it's important to note that it doesn't just stay when you're using pesticides. Um, it, it becomes an issue that farmers have more cancers than the normal population. So there became a realization that we really need to be getting away from using chemicals that can cause cancer and the organic um, chemicals are very low to, I mean, none for using soap. I can use it in bare hands. Um, and um, oils, I wear gloves, but the toxicity level is extremely low. Um, so you're, you're trying, again, to use P IPM is going to help you to stop that cycle. It will give you a way to be sustainable in your home, and I mean, I've heard stories of when I'm on hotline, people spray their house and they just grab something from the store. And then they have a situation where um, their kids are now getting sick. Um, you just don't want to do that. You want to follow directions from the UC. They've come up with some really great stuff. Um, it's like on fleas, um, on ants. So you're not poisoning yourself. Um, that I, I was working in the nursery and some guy came in smelling like chemicals. And he decided to use a hose-in sprayer to spell, spray herbicide. And I mean, um, Roundup, um, this might be showing some signs that there might be carcinogenic. I mean, it's not about, I mean, I'm not going to, the UC doesn't weigh in on that yet, but it, it's, there's, some, there's some issues starting to show, but not confirmed. And this man had been spraying and the wind was all over him. He was drenched with chemicals. And I was just kind of horrified. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, you want to be using, if you go on here, it will give you that you can put caulk in your cracks for your ants. You can use baits that are like boric acid. That have absolutely, it's not something you want to have someone eat, but it's definitely non-toxic. They carry it back, they go to their nest and then it kills the queen. You're not spraying around your foundation and it's getting back into you. So yes, um, this, this will help you have an, a less toxicity, less cancer, as far as the least toxic way that, again, this is what this whole thing is about, non-toxic non -toxic options. And um, by going to this site, they've been studying it, they've been coming up with ways that you can get around that. And the organic methods, most of them when you see soaps, um, there's something called LD50. That means you spray it and half of the population dies 
of whether they sprayed it on, um, 50%. And, and the numbers for the um, non-toxic ones um, show that it's not toxic. And the ones then are for the really toxic stuff, it doesn't take much to kill. And so, um, you know, I share this with you and I'm there telling you this because the UC has come up to the plate and said, we need to help the public learn how to have a safer environment and do it a way that protects their family and protects the environment. So um, good idea. Um, yeah, so the reality is that if you go in and use this, this will help you in your efforts to keep your um, pests down and you can encourage having a balance in your garden. I have to say, I have people stop at my yard, I'm not telling where I am, and I have tons of birds and I have all these insects and they're good insects. I mean, we have little um, carpenter bees, the females are golden brown and they look like little teddy bears and they're adorable and they're flying around and they won't hurt anybody. They come up to me and say, this is my area and then they walk, they fly away. But, but um, there's numerous, I have bumblebees, I have native bees, which are tiny. And I'm, I hesitate, you know, this, and I go around to looking at yards and there's just lawn and some shrubs. And um, by using this handout, you can create a habitat for native insects that will butterflies. And when I first grew up in Santa Clara County, um, during the 60s, there was actually butterflies everywhere. It was like unbelievable. It's like when you go to these places and they have a root place to go into and there's butterflies all over, that's the way it was here. People grew hollyhocks, they grew flowers, and there were so many beautiful butterflies. We had the Anna swallowtails, the yellow black with the blue on the tail. We had, we had the beautiful monarchs. And just recently, since I teach at Santa Clara Unified for the teaching garden adult ed, we have been growing butter, we've been putting butterfly plants. We've recently had 50 monarchs now that we've, because 99% of them are killed by bugs, we as soon as we see the caterpillar, we save it, we grow it, and we let it loose again. So um, we are growing back the butterflies that used to be here. Um, but it's really exciting when you actually are able to create this incredible diversity and it could be in your wonderful um, yard. You can have things, and I'm just aside, you can use things like um, flowers that feed birds, thistles like flowers. So you can do um, incredible, um, one of the ones that is in the list actually feeds the finches. So um, you can use those and suddenly you have tiny birds that would be like something like an ornament off your Christmas tree and you have yellow and gray and they're tiny birds that are on your apple and then they're eating insects. And at the same time, you could put up a black um, niger thistle feeder and you're feeding them. So suddenly you have, they're eating your flower, the flower seeds like bachelor buttons, they love that. Um, and you're suddenly having a bird sanctuary, you're having um, these insects that are beautiful, and you're creating the sort of heaven in your little garden. So yes, it's creating habitats. Um, yeah, good point on the ladybugs. Um, on ladybugs, it's really important. I should get into that. You should always have some sort of insect for it to feed on. So say you have a bunch of aphids and you've made sure there's no ants protecting them because they will cut off your ladybugs. What you would want to do is um, that you would definitely plant them at dusk and you can spray them. And I have to say, um, yeah, they disperse within a day. What you do is you put them at the base in the, at the, um, or next to where the insects are, you put them almost dark. And then what I was taught is you can shake up a soda that does not have caffeine. Caffeine kills insects. Yes, it will kill them. So you spray something like a, a seven up and you spray it and you um, spray the ladybugs. They get a little sticky with sugar and then they'll stay till morning and they'll eat. By the time they leave, they will have taken your um, insect up. So yeah, you can use ladybugs. I'm sorry, any more questions before I go anymore? Um, but yes, I, I find that I am not afraid of using soap. And when I get aphids, I use soap and I put on rubber gloves and 
do it. And um, actually, there on the nurse, the nurseries have called insecticidal soap. It's the kind of soap when we were kids they used to have in the bathrooms that smelled bad and was thick and viscous. You put the right amount in your in a spray bottle that would be a quart or a gallon. Follow directions. You don't want to smother your uh, plants and have them not breathe. And then you shake it up and then you basically spray your plants and you get in wherever the aphids are. And sometimes I use my rubber gloves and make sure it gets all in between them um, and it will get rid of them. Um, some people say, well, I just use this. Well, the UC doesn't have that. They just say insecticidal soap. And so um, it works really well, completely non-toxic. Um, and it's a wonderful thing. And so if you look at your bug, if it says it uses soap, you can use soap. Um, any other questions? So I, um, it's a good question. So someone asked about, you know, how, like, if you have pesticide and you want to dispose them, so I just put the link for the Santa, Santa, Clara, excuse me, Santa Clara County hazardous waste disposal. So it's good that if you want to get rid of them, but don't trash them, you know, because like I said, things can get into our waterways and yes. collect the bag. Um, not even recycling, but make sure that you check out the website. Uh, so it's the Santa Clara County hazardous waste disposal and uh, you can arrange to drop off and um, let's see. But yes. Yeah, it's on the chat, you know, if you can see that, but if you don't, um, you can just Google, um, you know, Santa Clara County. Um, um, Hopefully I can get this together. Pesticide also, yeah, so that, that would work. And I think we come oh. to the end. I don't see any yeah. more questions. So I can't remember. This is the, the paper you have. This is the poster. And oops, well, if we had time, we got an evasive, but if you see a mahogany label, it's not. So oops, well, we're gonna end it. Okay. So, so we have a couple of minutes. So if you want to just finish off, yeah. We yeah, have that, five point so, six. So mainly I just wanted to leave you with observe, observe, observe. Do not go into your gardens, flip over leaves, see what's out there. Um, it will help you grow better plants and beautiful when you um Oh, someone wants to know about snails. Um, when you, well, I'll tell you what happens. Here's the deal. Um, when you leave mulch down, I, I often used to tease, I teach children a lot about gardens and I tease them and say, hey, have you seen the forest patrol? And um, going through and fertilizing the forest and they're all going like, do we answer this? What is it, okay? No, but the leaves actually are decomposed and feed the trees. So if you leave mulch and leaves down, you feed your plants and we don't have to use fertilizers as much or not at all. So here's the deal. Um, snails, um, she said, do I, I don't like to leave mulch. Well, um, if you start having a natural garden, I don't see snails anymore because I have a possum that eats them <laughs> and um, they're gone. Um, but um, leaves do decompose and you can, um, put them in, um, sometimes I take, like right now the leaves are dropping out here and I'll throw them up on my beds. It looks very messy and people don't like it. You can run your lawnmower over them and put them in the bag and then put them and make a nice mulch. Um, and you and it basically, when you start digging your soil, you get more and more worms and it's really black. And because if you lift up our log, you'd see black underneath. Now, but we had, um, but here's the problem, Frenchman. A Frenchman came and, um, well, in snails, and when something doesn't have a predator, it gets out of control. So for snails, go to our UC website, look up snails. You can use different methods to get rid of them, and so many of them non-toxic. And um, yes, I use mulch, and I don't have snail problems at all because the possums have moved in, and um, I don't mind them being here, um, and there, there are no snails here. So um, if you start working with nature, instead of fighting, um, things go really well. So, um, so can, oak leaves, um, you know what? You'd have to put it through, a, when things are thick, if they're not ripped, they don't decompose. And oak leaves, if they're the green native oak, um, they may not decompose with the stickers on them, on the leaves. Whereas if you're back east, they have the smooth oak, they'll decompose. So what you'd wanna do is put them through a lawnmower and mulch them up and then they work fine as a mulch. Anybody else? Because we're running out of time. I think that's, a, that's about it. Um, 
Oh, there is a last one, last question about oak leaf as a mulch. Can we use oak leaf as a mulch? Yes, that's the one I said, putting it through the uh, a mulcher so that it's finely ripped. When you mulch, when you cut things up, they'll decompose. If they have a waxy coating like our um, live oaks, which we have here, they won't decompose very well. Um, how else? Well, you can buy a, um, I'm not going to, I'm as a UC person, I don't name companies, um, but if you find something to get a chipper, it can work really well. So, um, or, you know, you're, you're going to have to figure out a way to break them up. Um, someone yeah, has a question? Yeah. Well, I mean, well, thank you everyone that hang tight with us. You know, we have over a hundred people today and we still have 77 on still listening to the end. Um, like I uh, like our uh, Nevin said, you know, the library will post everything on Central Park Library YouTube uh, link and she will email everyone again about the link and information when it's ready. And, and I think that would be all for today. And don't Thank hesitate so to much. call. Thank you so much. And I will be posting this recording on uh, library's YouTube channel and I will email everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hope to see you in another uh, program. Bye. Have a good evening. Good evening.